At the beginning of the film, we find ourselves sweeping over the countryside of rural Maine. A local fish and game officer, Walt Lawson, is scuba diving in an expansive lake while his colleague, Sheriff Hank Keel, waits in their boat chomping on snacks. As Lawson peers into a hole in the depths, he is approached and attacked from behind by a predator we can't yet make out. The sheriff then looks on as his colleague is dragged across the surface water at pace. Suddenly, an oxygen tank appears, bobbing on the surface, followed by Lawson, who clutches at the side of the boat. He is hauled aboard by Keel, who is startled to find Lawson's leg have been entirely bitten off. What was the attacker? This is Movie Shortens. Follow us today to the movie titled Lake Placid 1999. Be aware, there are spoilers. Over at the American Museum of Natural History, paleontologist Kelly Scott is analyzing a fossil. However, she is also having difficulty breathing. It transpires that her lover has left her. She is comforted by a colleague who we then learn is now seeing Kelly's former partner. In the next scene, Kelly is dispatched to Black Lake by her boss. A tooth recovered from the attack has shown bizarre similarities to a dinosaur fossil. Though reluctant due to her fear of the wilderness, Kelly is given no choice but to go on the mission. As a result, we soon see her airborne, flying over the forested area. Now, in the Morgan, Maine, Kelly is given the tooth to analyze. She identifies it as reptilian. She is then shown the body of the victim, Lawson. Shocked at the state of it, she asks to join the expedition to the lake. Soon, the sheriff and the lady from New York begin to pack a vehicle in preparation for their adventure. Here, Kelly is introduced to another fish and game officer, Jack Wells. They get off on the wrong foot as Kelly accuses them of patronizing her. An attractive passerby then interjects. The paleontologist shows clear disgust at how quickly the heads of the two men are turned by this presence. Clearly, she considers Maine a little backward and somewhat sexist in comparison with their home city. On the way to the lake, the guys stop off at a house of a local resident, Miss Bickerman. They want to find out if she knows anything about the deaths on the lake. First though, they ask after her husband, only to find he is dead. She claims to have killed him herself as a mercy killing at his request. She heavily denies the involvement of a mystery predator or indeed any knowledge of it, however. Over at the lake, along with a number of support staff from the sheriff's department, the group begins to set up camp. Kelly expresses her concern at the behavior of the men to a female compatriot, but is ignored. She then continues to verbally joust with Jack Wells who is cynical as to why she is there and how she will cope with the expedition. He jokes with her about her dislike of mosquitoes and the care she takes of her nails. The next person to join the team is Hector Sear, a crocodile enthusiast. He tells them he is there to help them find one. The other members of the party express doubt that a crocodile could have traveled this far north, but Hector remains convinced that this is what lies behind the attacks. This, despite the fact it would have had to have swum through the ocean to get there. Out on the lake and traveling by canoe, the four main protagonists continue to bicker. Soon, they witness a school of perch in a panic. Mere seconds later, the canoe carrying Kelly and Keel is flipped over by an unknown and unseen force. The two of them scramble to climb into its underside, desperate to keep their legs out of the water. They make it back to shore, shaken, wet, but intact. Now at the camp, Hector finds a severed toe in the undergrowth. This he presents to the sheriff as evidence of the crocodile's presence. As night falls, many of the party begin to have an actual party and are seen dancing to the music of Tom Jones in one of the bigger tents. Outside of this, the relationship between Jack and Kelly begins to bloom. She tells him a story of her childhood in a similar location, skimming stones. He encourages her to stay on the shore, but she resists. She then shares the details of her recent breakup with him and restates her commitment to their mission, seemingly winning him over in the process. In the bushes, meanwhile, Hector is arranging a spring trap. Here, he is confronted by the sheriff who is clearly unhappy about this and tells him to stop. The two argue about it before the sheriff angrily storms off. As he does so, he falls into another trap which had previously been dug by members of his own team at the behest of his new nemesis, the crocodile man Hector. The next day, out on the lake, Hector and Jack suit up and dive in in search of the attacker. Up on the surface, the sheriff, his deputy, and Kelly chat away. Suddenly, their boat is tugged away at speed, propelling the female member of the crew into the water. Having spotted a school of perch beginning to panic nearby, she does so too. However, she is soon fished out, with Hector also making it back safely. Seconds later, the as-yet-unseen predator springs from the water, biting the head of the sheriff's deputy clean off as it does so. Once back at camp, Hector tries to befriend Hank Keel. The sheriff is resistant though and walks off. As he makes to leave, he is suddenly sprung into the air via another trap the crocodile expert has laid. Once he is let down, he goes after Hector with the stick, but is quickly interrupted by a bear, 
which burst out of the forest. The growling intruder doesn't prove a threat for long though, as it quickly is caught in the jaws of an enormous crocodile which emerges from the lake. The bear is dragged away and into the murky water by the enormous reptile. Later that night, the antagonism between Hector and Hank continues to grow. The naturalist tells the law enforcement officer he is an expert in karate. The sheriff responds to this by punching him. Hector is clearly irritated by this, mainly because in karate, apparently, you have to say go before starting a fight. The next day, the team continues their search by helicopter. They head to a cove which Hector has identified as being the crocodile's home. Here, they locate the severed head of the deputy. Jack then spots the reptile nearby via his binoculars. It is being fed a blindfolded dairy cow by the elderly female resident living on the edge of the lake, Mrs. Bickerman. When interrogated, she tells them she's been feeding it for six years after it followed her husband home. And she continues to do so despite the fact she now admits it was the crocodile that killed him. Having donned his wetsuit and ignoring the protestations of Kelly, Hector enters the water in the cove. The crocodile soon spots him and begins to slowly approach him. The scientist retreats cautiously in the direction of the helicopter, instructing Kelly to start the engine. At the last second, he uses an inflatable to distract the croc and hops aboard. However, the beast makes a grab for the helicopter skid and clings to it by its mouth. With the help of a few shots from Kelly's pistol, they wrestle themselves free and make it away. Safely back at camp, Jack takes Hector to task over his action, telling him he put the others at risk. He says he only got away because the crocodile had just consumed the full cow. The group of them argue as to their next step, with Hector strongly in favor of tranquilizing the croc after luring it onto the land. Jack, on the other hand, is against the idea of taking it alive, but Kelly attempts to convince him otherwise. Eventually, they agree to Hector's plan, but with the option of killing the croc if things go awry. They then head off to Mrs. Bickerman's house to seize a cow, to lure her in their predatory foe. As the plot unfolds, we find Hector manning his helicopter with the cow attached, swinging below it in a harness. Mrs. Bickerman, who is being housed by a member of the sheriff's department, tells her warden that she is rooting for the reptile. The living, breathing, wriggling bait is dipped in and out of the water to attract the attention of the crocodile. By nightfall, however, this has proven an unsuccessful ploy. The team are just about to wind things up when the situation changes and the attack is spotted on the radar screen. Hector leads the croc towards the edge of the lake and the rest of the team train their tranquilizer guns upon it, with one shot hitting the target. In the excitement, Hector loses control of the chopper though and it plunges into the water. Fortunately, he is able to extricate himself from the cockpit and stands on top of the partially sunken wreck of a flying machine, contemplating his next move. Seconds later, the croc lunges at the sheriff who is positioned at the water's edge. It creeps onto the beach, knocking over Kelly with its tail. Now isolated, she finds herself in a vulnerable position, separated from the others. On the advice of Hector, she decides to swim to him to escape its clutches. Underwater, she is able to evade her poorly sighted pursuer, but her ankle becomes entangled in the vegetation below. The croc catches sight of her and tries to attack, but only succeeds in taking a bite out of a wooden post. This gives Kelly the chance to get away and make it to the helicopter. After a brief pause, the crocodile re-emerges under the helicopter and continues its assault but ultimately entraps itself within the cockpit. Now stuck, it slowly falls asleep under the influence of the sedatives. The group begin to argue as to whether it should be exterminated, with the sheriff clearly in favor of this drastic step. Jack is also apparently on his side. As Kelly begs Jack not to shoot, he ignores her and fires, but fortunately, it is only with another sedating dart. At this point, shockingly, another crocodile propels itself out of the water and takes a chunk out of Hector's leg. This one, however, is quickly dispatched by trigger-happy Sheriff who takes pleasure in his kill. In the final sequences of the film, Jack offers Kelly a ride as the budding romance between them appears to be blossoming. Meanwhile, over at Mrs. Bickerman's house, we find her at the end of a pier, feeding bread to a number of tiny baby crocodiles. Elsewhere, on a highway, what we can assume to be one of their parents is being carted away, tied to a truck for further research. Clearly, this is not the end of the story. Like and subscribe to watch more videos like this, and don't forget to turn on your notifications. That really helps my channel. Thanks for watching.